Um, I have a lot of slides, but I go pretty fast. And some of this um, may review a couple of things that you've already heard so that we can go even faster through that. But um, you'll find this is a topic I'm pretty passionate about. So I'm happy to be here talking about it today. So if we look at you know the way people have viewed healthcare in the past, um, Hippocrates said in the third century BC that the natural force within each one of us is the greatest healer of disease. And he actually got it. You know, he, he wrote a lot about how people's thoughts and feelings affected how they felt physically, and that you had to treat the whole person, not just the physical disease. In the 18th century, um, this is one of my favorite medicine quotes, um, Voltaire said that the art of medicine is actually just amusing the patient while nature affects the cure. Um, you know, which basically, again, sort of underscores the idea that the human body does have a tremendous ability to heal itself. We don't talk about that too much anymore. We kind of forget that the human body can heal itself. We think of the human body as kind of a rusty car, like Dr. Chaudhry said earlier, and that, you know, once things go wrong, you just need a lot of new parts. Um, this is not the quote from a famous person. I actually made this up. But um, I think that if you talk about the way medicine is now, it's sort of like waiting until a person is as sick as possible and then doing everything possible to interfere with natural healing. So again, that wasn't a famous person, but um, I think that's kind of the state that we've arrived at, which is a little sad. People have a lot of misinformation about health and disease, and they have a lot of ideas that are incorrect. A lot of people believe that they get an illness because of genetics or because um, it runs, you know, obviously that's the same thing, it runs in their family, or it's just bad luck. They think that if they get a disease, there's a medicine for that. And, and that, you know, modern technology and medicine is so great that there's just a medicine or a procedure or surgery for everything. They also believe that, you know, human beings live longer, and so that must mean that we're healthier. And they think that um, you know, medical technology is so good that all diseases basically have pretty good treatment. What's really true in America is that most of the diseases that affect people are caused by poor lifestyle choices. Um, and even the ones that aren't directly caused by that are usually made worse by it. <clears throat> um, a lot of the illnesses that people have, if you've ever been involved in treatment for a, a medical disease or a physical illness, you'll realize that a lot of problems really don't have good medical treatment. Um, you know, chronic pain syndromes are the most obvious thing. There are a lot of pain syndromes that are really inadequately treated by um, most of the things that are routinely applied. But, you know, I spend a lot of time in the hospital and there are lots of people with chronic diseases that, you know, are receiving every possible thing that medical technology can bring to bear. And they're not only not well, but they're really doing extremely poorly. So it, it's really a myth that we have good treatment for everything. Um, it's also true that even though people do live longer, that a significant portion of older Americans are spending um, the last years of their lives in conditions where they can't do what they want to do, they don't feel good, it's really a, a pretty low quality of life. And so we know uh, that length of life doesn't necessarily um, translate into quality of life for a lot of people. The three biggest diseases in Western civilization are pretty much preventable problems. And, and actually, we've known this for many years. Um, of course, we don't really teach much about this in medical school, but we do know this. There are some areas where we have made advances. You know, 50 years ago, people didn't really think that cigarettes were bad for you. Okay, and we've at least convinced people that cigarettes are bad for you. We still have trouble getting people, you know, to not take up smoking or to quit once they've started, but at least I think if you polled Americans, you'd get close to 100% of people who would tell you that smoking is bad for you. We've made, you know, less in the way of inroads in terms of other lifestyle behaviors because people really don't get the connection between exercise, nutrition, and stress management, even though there has been good evidence about this in, in uh, the medical literature for years. So I'm gonna go through this kind of fast. Some of this is stuff that you probably already know or that you've heard a little bit about today, but 
if we just look at exercise, and I'm, I'm just going to talk about research evidence. These are not my opinions for the next few slides. This is what we know from science. We know that a sedentary lifestyle is one of the top risk factors for heart disease, and that we've actually known since the 1950s. That was one of the first connections that people made between lifestyle and disease. Um, there have been numerous studies that have confirmed this. Um, we also know that if you don't exercise enough, you're more likely to be overweight and to have diabetes, and those are independent risk factors for heart disease. The reason that exercise is important is because it has effects on improving circulation and circulatory efficiency, and it also has effects on metabolism all through the body. Um, and if you don't get enough exercise, your heart isn't going to um, be doing uh, appropriate circulation, and it's not going to be helping you metabolize the way that you should. Moderate to high levels of physical activity are associated with reduced risk of total ischemic and hemorrhagic strokes. Uh, ischemic are the kind that you get from not getting enough blood to the brain, and hemorrhagic are the kind of strokes that you get when you have bleeding in the brain. Um, and if people exercise regularly, they can reduce their um, risk of stroke significantly. And stroke is one of the top three killers of people in the West. Um, the National Cancer Institute which, Institute, which probably 20 years ago would have said that, you know, there's no relationship between exercise and cancer, now has pages on their website about the relationship between exercise and cancer. There's strong evidence to relate um, the level of physical activity to risk of getting cancer, either for the first time or uh, as a recurrent problem. And, you know, they've looked at all different kinds of cancers, and there's pretty strong correlation between exercise and most of the significant ones that affect people in our culture. People who exercise regularly are less likely to get lung disease. <clears throat> and interestingly, even if you smoke, your lungs are healthier if you exercise than if you don't exercise. Not that I can recommend that particular combination. But, um, you know, exercise is even preventive, or at least protective to some degree, of lung disease in smokers. <clears throat> they did a really interesting study um, fairly recently about the effects of exercise on aging. Um, after which, and, and based on this study and other studies, they really concluded that a lot of the um, changes in the body that are associated with aging are related to the decrease in the level of exercise that most people experience as they get older. Is there anyone in this room who's over 30 who gets as much exercise as they did when they were 15? Good for you. Um, in our culture, that's pretty uncommon. Um, most people's exercise level and activity level goes down significantly after age 35. Um, so they did this study where they took healthy 20-year-old volunteers they put them in bed for three weeks, after which they adopted the physical characteristics of elderly men. And then, this is a great study, 30 years later, they found those same people and they looked at, you know, their age-related changes where they had lost strength, they'd lost flexibility, they'd lost aerobic capacity. They trained them and uh, within a fairly short period of time, they were able to regain the same exercise uh, fitness level that they'd had when they were 20 years old in the earlier part of the study. Um, so if you think that you know this all happens just as you get older and that's an accident too, that's wrong. If you look at people that are really physically active throughout their life, they tend to look a lot younger than they are. There was a really interesting study that was published um, in 2013 that hit all the major newspapers. I don't know if any of you saw it, but it said that <clears throat> Based on this particular study, which was a study looking at all the studies out there on exercise and heart disease, they found that exercise was as effective as medication for treating diabetes, heart disease, and stroke. You can imagine how happy the pharmaceutical people were to hear that. If we look at diet for a few slides, um, you know, again, you've probably heard a lot of this stuff, but high intake of processed meats, eggs, red meats, High-fat dairy products have been associated with the biomarkers of heart disease, meaning high cholesterol, high triglycerides, all the things that we can measure on blood tests that tell us that a person is at risk for or already has heart disease. Um, and if you eat more fiber, you're less likely to get cardiovascular disease of any type, including coronary artery disease, which is kind of getting clogged arteries in the heart itself. 
Um, for both fruit and grain fiber, there's actually a, a direct relationship between the amount of fiber that you take in your diet and the risk of heart disease that you have. So the more fiber, less heart disease, and vice versa. A recent study at Harvard showed that five servings of fruits and vegetables, which you know currently is probably achieved by about 20% of the population, um, can cut your stroke risk by 30%, and there are particular types of fruits and vegetables that seem to be particularly beneficial for that stroke reduction effect. We've seen that increased intake of fruits and vegetables, which, by the way, include a lot of the antioxidants that Zahida talked about in, in her talk. Um, these actually interfere with the process of developing many of the most common forms of cancer. So it's not just that you know we think, well, you eat this stuff and you know maybe that's good for you, but we can actually see in the lab these things interfering with the growth of cancer. <clears throat> We've known that total fat intake of more than 30% of total calories increases the risk of developing some cancers, and this is particularly true when you're talking about saturated fats. Saturated fats tend to be the stuff that come from animal products, um, and you know, again, this is all, I'm, I'm taking this information from the most conservative sites that are out there. This is the kind of information that is now showing up on National Cancer Institute websites, you know, American Heart Association. These are not like alternative medicine websites that I'm getting this stuff from. These are all articles that are in mainstream medical journals. And this information is out there, you know, like the CDC, NIH, it, it, it's everywhere. Again, not that you're gonna hear it from your doctor, but it's out there. Um, they've seen that various components of food, um, as I said, can decrease the risk of cancer, and these are things like the phytochemicals, antioxidants, omega-3 fatty acids, things that are found in foods like fruits and vegetables, green tea, actually chocolate, not too much, oily fish, nuts, things like that. I have a whole file in my office on the health benefits of chocolate. <clears throat> Although, again, you can always have too much of a good thing, right? Um, the Arthritis Foundation, again, not a fringe organization. The Arthritis Foundation, you know, is actually recommending an anti-inflammatory diet, very similar to what Andrew Weil would recommend to reduce inflammation um, in processes like arthritis. <coughs> Stress is another thing that is a problem, as you've already heard. Um, increased stress levels have been associated with increased risk of upper respiratory infections. There was a really good study done at the University of Pittsburgh um, that showed that um, people with more stress who had cold viruses dropped into their noses during this study were more likely to get sick than people who didn't have high stress and also were exposed to cold viruses. Uh, that study's been repeated many times. They've been able to show that if you're highly stressed when you get your flu vaccine, it's less likely to work for you. And they've been able to actually measure, you know, things in the immune system that are good for you that um, are of lower levels in your bloodstream when you're highly stressed. So we've, we've known actually for quite a while that stress has a major impact on the immune system and not in a good way. This is one of the studies that I've been talking about the most when I go out and talk to groups, which I do a lot of in this area. <clears throat> there was a study out of Ohio State University that I think was published in 2012. They took all of their breast cancer patients over the last several years and they randomized them into um, either a conventional treatment group or a conventional treatment plus stress management intervention group. And the stress management intervention consisted of weekly meetings for four months, and then after that, monthly meetings for eight months. So they had meetings with the clinical psychologist over the period of a year that taught them stress management techniques, talked to them about the importance of diet, nutrition, coping skills, how to um, uh, sort of develop your social network to get your family and friends to support you through the process of having cancer. They followed these women for 11 years and they found that the women who went through the intervention program were about 50% less likely to get recurrent cancer and about 60% less likely to die from cancer. And again, this was 
because they did a stress management program over a year and then for the rest of the 11 years they were on their own. Even in the women who got recurrent cancer, if they were the ones who had gone through the stress management program, their initial stress levels on learning of the recurrent diagnosis went up really high, but then they came down and their outcomes were better. The women who had a recurrent cancer and had not gone through the stress management program had really high stress levels that stayed high and they didn't do as well. Uh, I think that study is really interesting. So to summarize what I've said so far, you know, this is actually simpler than we make it. You know, human bodies are designed for movement. They're designed to run on healthy fuels. And they're designed to handle short periods of stress, but not long, chronic periods of stress. And so when we don't get enough exercise, when we don't eat the right foods, and when we're stressed all the time, the system breaks down and it's just not sustainable. Um, we are also learning from a lot of new research that's coming out that a lot of this is linked not only to oxidative stress, which is a part of insulin metabolism, but that almost all of these processes are linked to insulin metabolism. Now we think of insulin as something that is important in diabetes, but insulin is important in almost everything. When people don't get enough exercise or when they eat the wrong kinds of foods, their insulin metabolism is dysfunctional. That leads to oxidative stress and other things that promote inflammation in the body. Now you need some inflammation. If you twist your ankle, you need to have you know, fluid run into that area and blood cells go in there to help you know, sort of make that better over a period of time. But we've learned now that all of the major diseases that affect people, like heart disease, like diabetes, like um, uh, various lung disorders, like arthritic conditions, like autoimmune conditions, are related to uncontrolled inflammation in the body. And again, this doesn't just happen to people. Even if you're predisposed to getting these things because of a genetic condition, studies have shown that you can regulate your genes by the lifestyle choices that you make. If your um, family makes you more at risk to get cardiovascular disease, if you eat right and you get exercise and you do stress management, you're going to turn your risk much lower than someone who has a family risk but doesn't do those things. And we've always, or at least we've known for a few years now that exercise and nutrition were related to the insulin pathways. We've also known for a long time that chronic stress impairs immune system function but there were a couple recent studies that came out that made it um, pretty apparent that even stress can filter down to how insulin metabolism occurs and it can contribute to that process that promotes inflammation as well. I think there's going to be a lot more information coming out about this in the next few years. Now the trouble comes when the rubber hits the road. You know, what physicians have done for years is after they've given you the prescriptions for your medications, you know, for your problem, and they've talked to you about what procedures or surgeries you can have when the medicines don't work, then they hand you a sheet of paper that says, oh, by the way, here's some exercise and nutrition trip tips once you go home and do that too, okay? And that doesn't work. You know, the, the sort of handout as the last thing that happens in the doctor's office has never worked. Um, and even people who understand that exercise, nutrition, and stress management are important have difficulty making those changes in their lives. <clears throat> um, you know, it, it's definitely true that doctors don't put enough emphasis on educating people about the importance of lifestyle factors. It's easier for them to just prescribe pills, but a lot of patients come in and, and they want the easy way too. You know, they don't want to do any hard work, they just want to pill for something so that they can go home and watch TV. So there's a problem on both sides. And if we're going to change that whole thing, we have to figure out how to motivate people and how to help them change behavior in a society that does not promote healthy lifestyles. It's really hard to get people to make short-term changes for long-term benefit. You know, there are books on this, you know, psychology 101, people don't like doing something now that they consider giving something up for something that they think is going to happen 50 years from now. 
people also think that healthy lifestyles, you know, are like some kind of horrible boot camp. You know, that it's like exercise is torture, eating healthy is disgusting, you know, and stress management is like some woo-woo medicine that, you know, it's just BS. So people aren't really, really convinced that this is what they need to do. <clears throat> And as I've mentioned, our society does not promote a healthy lifestyle. You know, we drive everywhere, we sit and, and do all of our activities in a sitting way, we're surrounded by bad food choices everywhere we go, and we're surrounded by this frantic pace of life that people just consider normal. <clears throat> you know, I always say that um, probably a few thousand years ago, like being chased by a saber-toothed tiger was probably pretty stressful too. But when you were being chased by saber-toothed tigers, the difference was that you sat around, you know, first of all, either the tiger got you and it's over or you got away. It doesn't last that long, right? You're not running from a saber-toothed tiger all day. The other difference is that when people were being chased by saber-toothed tigers, they didn't go home at night and watch TV. They sat around the fire and they told stories, and they sang, and they danced, and that's how they relieved their stress, by connecting with each other in a way that, you know, um, was meaningful. And, and there was often a spiritual component to that as well. So we don't, you know, this kind of stuff on the right-hand side of the screen, that doesn't really vent a lot of stress, watching cop shows on TV. So, um, you know, if any of you have been to other countries, you know that a lot of other countries have healthier lifestyles than we do, and, and that's their default position. You know, their default position is to walk or ride a bike everywhere. If you want to see something really interesting, you should Google this thing. Um, Google rush hour in Utrecht. Utrecht is a study is a city in Holland that's spelled U-T-T-R-E-C-H-T. It's a, it's a fast motion video of a traffic intersection in a large town in Holland. It's just unbelievable. Thousands and thousands and thousands of bicycles going back and forth, and every once in a while, a car or a bus goes by. It's just unbelievable. Um, I was actually in Belgium last year, and we took a train from Brussels to Ghent, which is a town of about 70,000 people. And when we got out of the train station in Ghent, there was a bicycle parking area next to the train station where I would estimate there were approximately 5,000 bicycles parked. It was unbelievable. I've never seen anything like it in my life. <clears throat> so if we're going to change the way people behave, first of all, we do have to educate them. But education is never enough. You can educate people until you're blue in the face. It doesn't really change behavior. What people need is coaching. They need health coaching, healthy lifestyle coaching. They need practical, doable steps, a little bit at a time, things that promote confidence and well-being, and they see, hey, this isn't so hard. It's not so bad. I actually like that food. I really enjoyed going for a walk with my friend last night. They need to start with little things that they can increase on. Um, you know, Andrew Wilde does this. He says, you know, his book about I forget actually the title of it, but it's basically try a couple things this week, add a couple more to that next week, a little bit at a time. That's what people can accomplish. That's what they can actually pull off. You have to meet people where they are. You know, I've been doing this kind of a lifestyle for 30 years. It's so easy for me. I can't even imagine like eating muffins that somebody brings into work from Sam's Club. What's in that stuff? You know, I, like I'm not even tempted. Um, but people come to this from all different places and you have to meet them where they are. You have to be a role model. As I mentioned, small steps, things that aren't hard and don't seem, you know, so onerous. People need really individualized programming. This is never going to be a one-size-fits-all because everyone's coming to it from a different place. And you need to see these people frequently. You know, you don't give someone, you know, a plan to modify their entire lifestyle and then say, I'll see you back in three months. Do you see them back in three weeks and ask them how it's going? What do you need to change? What can we improve over here? Great job on this. You know, you, you need to see people frequently. Um, and you need to actually teach them usable skills. Cooking classes. How do you use a pedometer? Do a relaxation thing during the doctor visit. I used to do that all the time. 
There are other modalities that can be brought in to help. Things like acupuncture, um, you know, all these relaxation techniques can help with uh, smoking cessation, can help with weight loss, can help with stress management. Things like yoga and Tai Chi are great ways to do exercise because they also have a stress management component. Um, it's kind of a two for, you know, Americans love that two for one. Um, uh, there are things like cognitive behavioral therapy and dialectical behavior therapy, mindfulness training that really actually help change behavior. You can't just say, do this thing. You have to help people get into a neural frame of mind where they can actually change behavior. And there are many other things that I could mention. This has been brought up. Uh, you know, one of the things that I do at Allegheny General Hospital is I work a few hours a week in the employee health office. It is really unbelievable what's happening to this country with medication in general, but pain medication in particular, it's really a, an amazing health crisis. I just heard on the way here today, I think they said that, um, I'm going to get this wrong, but Pennsylvania, the one thing that really stuck with me was in Pennsylvania last year, more people died of drug, opiate-related I think most of them are overdoses. More people died of opiate-related causes than died in car accidents last year in Pennsylvania. This is a huge problem. I see this almost every day in my office. Um, it's really scary. On a larger scale, in addition to, how am I doing? I showed you five some. Okay, so I have like two slides left, I'm almost done. On a larger scale, in addition to things that we do with individual patients, we really have to think about this in a community and, and even a national model. We have to serve as role models for a community. We have to think about you know, community gardens and, and community um, programs that can teach kids a different way to live. Um, we need to really help promote a culture that promotes health. Eventually, this has to occur on a legislative uh, agenda in some ways. You know, we can't legislate our way into good health. But just as an example, I'm traveling to Washington, D.C. next week to be involved in an advocacy effort to try to get the routine use of antibiotics out of factory farms. So people need to be doing things that, that they feel strongly about. Um, as a nation, we need to get back to non-industrialized food sources, you know, reasonable work schedules that people can actually have a decent life with, more opportunities to connect with others and have spiritual growth and connection. I'll just say quickly that, you know, the Affordable Care Act could be the best thing that ever happened in medicine because all of a sudden, eventually, we're going to be paid for making people better and not just doing stuff to them. And the last quote I would leave you with is Mahatma Gandhi, I think you've all heard this, what we have to do is be the change that we want to see. So thank you for your time. Thank you.